morning. I'm super excited for the conversation today. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Okay, cool. So we're, we're going to be talking about extremely sensitive information, how we can organize and build a, a better, uh, more equitable and ethical data economy, and particularly honing in on this concept of dignity. I think that there's a lot that the radical exchange community can learn from the healthcare community around this concept, um, because dignity was a significant issue in the 20th century for medicine, as we are often our most vulnerable in settings of healthcare. And dignity was invoked on opposing sides for uh, both sides of very conflicting arguments, and it's something we struggle with in the context of health today with things like genetic engineering, right to life, and now our data. And in the, the spirit of Radical Markets, the, the book, I thought it would be instructive to tell a narrative to set the stage and uh, see how we might learn, um, see what we might be able to learn from dignity in a healthcare setting. And to be clear, the following is a true story. Henrietta Lacks was a young black woman from Baltimore, where at the age of 31, she was diagnosed with an aggressive cervical cancer in 1951. While undergoing a routine medical treatment, as was the standard of the time, a portion of her cancer tissue was taken for medical research without her consent or her knowledge. And miraculously, her cancer cells went on to become the first human cells to be successfully grown in culture, giving Henrietta Lacks, although she passed away, a sort of immortality as her cells will live on indefinitely. They've been used for a wide range of advances in modern medicine, including HIV treatment, vaccines, chemotherapy, and gene mapping. And these, uh, these cells have contributed to billions of dollars of technology and tens of thousands of patents. However, it wasn't until several years later that Henrietta's surviving family became aware of their mother's significant contributions to humanity. And when they learned what had happened to their mother, they felt wronged, and what had continued to happen um, made them feel they had been wronged. And this is heightened by their, their condition at the time. Although billions of dollars had been made by Henrietta Lacks' cells, they did not have the money to pay for basic healthcare needs themselves. <coughs> Moreover, Lacks' family continues to be harmed today. In 2013, researchers published the DNA sequence of a strand of Henrietta Lacks' cells. And not only was that Henrietta Lacks' DNA, but it was also, in part, her surviving family's DNA, and that undermined their privacy and their dignity. Moreover, after news of Henrietta Lacks' abuse and, and several other uh, historical abuses in the 20th century, like the Tuskegee syphilis trials, participation in the scientific process by the black community in America has gone down to historic lows. Henrietta Lex's cells live on today and are still sold for thousands of dollars per vial. And I wanted to tell the story because it touches on many themes that I think are deeply relevant to our conversation around data dignity today, like consent, recognition, the interpersonal nature of our data, and compensation. And I have two esteemed colleagues with me on this panel today to help us unpack these ideas. Um, so, I would love it if you could introduce yourselves and talk a little bit about how you found yourself in this community and what interests you. Sean, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. Um, so you, you heard my last talk. Um, I got pulled into health. It wasn't anything, I didn't care about health, I'm not interested in health, um, but I got pulled into it because I realized um, how important data is and like ultimately, um, a, a good friend of mine says all computer scientists should be looking at genomics because it is a computer science problem. And um, for billions of years now, there's been this kind of Darwinian evolution. And right now, we can rewrite this stuff. And we need more computer scientists in here working on this. So that, that's really how I got pulled into health. Um, so I started studying collective cognition, so trying to think about how groups of people think together. And um, I guess I, as in, in the process of doing that, I started collaborating. Um, so we're always looking for, for good model organisms, organizations that, that record a lot of, of what happens. Um, so for the process of that, I started working with uh, an intensive care unit, uh, a research team inside the intensive care unit, um, where, where we have very detailed, like, microsecond level resolution about what, what choices the medical system and, 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 and the doctors and the nurses are making, what happens to the patients. Um, so that's kind of how, how I came into it. 
One thing that's different about our health information is that it's biographical, not autobiographical, much of the time. That is, we have a relative lack of control over its contents. You know, you might write a post on Facebook and clearly that, that content came from you, or tweet at me angrily after this, this panel, perhaps. Um, but your health information is often mediated by someone else, a physician or another healthcare professional. So how does this change the notion of data dignity? Um, so I think the, the notion of, of dignity for me is, is very hard to understand um, at, at individual levels. Um, so so it, it was, I w when I was preparing for the panel, I was trying to, to define dignity in, in some way. Um, and, and it was always this, this socially constructed or, or this socially placed thing. Um, so, and, and I think that this is, in, in some sense, um, this mediation that we have um, in, in our medical system, in, in its very structure. Um, so an example I, I, I often go back to is um, the way that we carry out medical trials um, with, with uh, double blinding um, makes the statistics more convenient, <laughs> but, um, but definitely reduces the autonomy of individuals, right? You, you don't know what, what you're taking. You're in, in a double blind trial, your doctor doesn't know what he's giving you. Um, doctors resist this um, often, so I've, I've more than once seen a doctor looking at an envelope against the light to decide uh, which envelope the patient was gonna be handed in the, in the randomized control trial. Um, blinding is, isn't perfect. Um, and, and I think th these are places in, in, in where, where you can see that the current medical system, like it's, it's very structured, which, which is, which many, many things there are, are there for, for good reasons, um, but it also doesn't have the, the it doesn't have the, the people or, or their communities at, at its center. So I think this is, this is one direction where aligning incentives uh, would, be, would be extremely helpful and, and, and would further, further dignity. Um, so we, we, we first looked at, at, at music, and so I think I can talk easier to the dignity um, um, of an artist, um, which is almost never one person. Like most of the property systems that we have from the patent system to the copyright system, trademark systems, um, they sort of assume like a singular author, this kind of lone genius does something, creates a patent, um, maybe the company licenses it, you know, whatever, but it's, um, in music, it doesn't work this way. In music, you have many collaborators, and um, like if anybody has heard the song Old Town Road, um, it was <laughs> made by a beat maker who was a kid um, in the Netherlands, and then somebody picked it up, it was shared over TikTok, it went, you know, to, super high in the charts and it kind of destroyed the whole music system because the system was um, based on having just a few people that are signed by labels. And so to me, dignity is that um, if you create value, you can be accounted for. And I think the accounting systems we have are so critical because the accounting systems we have right now, they don't really know how to um, account for uh, sort of the non-solo actor kind of Facebook, their balance sheet has, you know, maybe 40 billion US worth of what the accountants consider assets. And then all the rest of the money is from our data, but it's not on the balance sheet. So people don't have dignity. And so when you make um, a song and when you're a part of that process, if you make a beat and you don't get part of the royalties, then you're denied dignity. And so I would like to think that in some of these other creative professions like music, which got destroyed first by the internet. Um, I, no, music didn't get destroyed. Um, the ability to make money with music got destroyed by the internet. And um, I believe we can learn how do you come up with new accounting systems such that people actually get accounted for. Because to me, dignity is just you have a voice. You're, you can live, you can you know, not just survive, but you can thrive. I mean, is that how we account for the uh, strongly interpersonal nature of our healthcare data? You know, my genome is, is also in part my brother's or my mother's. Um, and it, it se that seems to be in tension with this individualistic notion of data as property, perhaps. Yeah. Um, so, so part of the reason that I'm really excited to be in this community is that um, this community seems willing to embrace new ideas of property. It's not just this kind of one person owns it. Um, 
so much of the wealth comes about because you can pool things together as a, as a collective, as a community. Yet the property systems, they're all nation state run um, and they're all based on this individual actor. So I think like absolutely like health um, to capture the dignity, to, to, to capture the value, you need these, these systems that can account for um, collaboration. Yeah. And is that the only thing that needs to change in order for us to be able to claim that we have healthcare data dignity? Is, is it simply a technical and then a property solution? Or is this perhaps, as I think Nikat would suggest, more of a social problem? You, you want to take the first crack? Okay. Um, <laughs> so yeah, sure. Um, so I guess the, um, so, a lot of the a lot of the talks that we saw that we saw this morning, um, they're they're effectively about you selling your data, and people are very loose about exactly what data you're selling. So there's there's the data that is easy to get, um, some <coughs> anonymized browser logs, or maybe not so anonymized browser logs, um, and there isn't a lot of thought about um, actually like the potential harms, right? So so which harms are immediate? Um, which benefits are immediate, which harms, you know, are, are, are potential but are, are very far in the future. Um, so I think bringing these things to the forefront would be a, would be a, a good way to guide us forward. Um, so, you know, your, your, your browser uh, history data contains um, excellent information about which diseases you have, right? Because we all write our symptoms into the same search engine. Um, the, um, you know, like, ec like epidemiologists make use of this data, right? This is how you predict uh, flu season. Um, the, um, I think the, the harms of, of selling this data, um, especially in, in, in genetics and, and in, in things where, where the, the, social, the social constructs around the diseases are, are, are very strong, um, the, the harms are potentially huge, and the, the individuals don't, don't have good ways of, of understanding the potential harms that they're that they're that they're agreeing to when when they when they click that button, um, I think that trying trying to to pick the the uh, the kinds of data that can be sold and the kinds of community that we should approach, we, we should be much more thoughtful, um, so that, so that we pick communities that that are sophisticated in terms of, of their relationship to their identity, um, so that we and, and and we stay away from communities that, that could do a lot of a lot of harms to themselves without, without realizing it um, and, and in ways that are very permanent, right? You, you sell your DNA, you're, you only get to do that once. Uh. Yeah, um, so um, a lot of what was <coughs> talked about today is technical solutions, even, even Bitmark, my, myself, we're working on in, in many ways as a technical solution. But, um, but I believe that, that any sort of like technical thing that Technologists believe can solve something. It usually and it's usually like utopian, and all utopias end in dystopia. Um, and so what um, what I'm really trying to figure out is how do you combine um, code and law and policy, and um, use the best of those um, those tools to address this issue. Like I, I'm I'm the son of a, a, a lawyer. My dad's an estate planner. And when I grew up, I thought for sure engineers would put lawyers out of business. You don't need law. Like you just have code, right? Code is law, right? And then I realized, no, no, actually, wait a second. So law is code that's been debugged for 5,000 years. And engineers can learn so much from lawyers, and especially in the field of data um, and how data is used. Um, uh, I feel that, um, that the law actually has a lot to teach us. And typically, you would say, hey, you know, the law has to catch up. The technologists are ahead, but I actually think it's the exact opposite when it comes to data. Um, is that the lawyers are way ahead? They've already thought about these problems, and it's the technologists that act as if the law doesn't exist. That there's not this thing known as consent. There's not this thing known as property, and we'll just go ahead and take all this stuff, like eminent domain, like there's some kind of country, and seizing our, you know, seizing what we're generating, seizing the value that we create, and then distorting markets because of that. And so. So, so any sort of one-dimensional approach, whether it's technology or policy or law, I think it doesn't have the tools necessary to solve this issue. And so how do we get enough people together that, that can have a diverse set of tools 
to address this issue. Yeah. And if we have the tools in place, to your point, I think it would be helpful to talk about how we might uh, be able to experiment with new models of data governance while mitigating, mitigating potential risks associated with sensitive data. So could you say a little bit about the ideas you have for moving forward, building new communities and models of data governance, but still mitigating risks? Yeah. Um, what's become apparent to me today is that we are kind of like grokking the same elephant, and we have different language. And the language we have is like incompatible in ways that are kind of unfortunate. Um, and so like there's this component to language of I don't know what to do here. You know, we call them data trusts. Uh, we've heard data collectives, data co-ops. Um, what do we do? Like there's there's this component that I think is really challenging. Um, and I think we need a lot more experimentation. Um, as I looked at the history of property um, and the way that the United States was structured where you had um, individual states that could experiment and then kind of the good ideas would bubble up, like as a system, the good ideas would bubble up to a federal level. Um, how do we do that with um, hopefully first the not so sensitive data, not the genomic data first? Um, the, the, the genomic data is unbelievably dangerous because you cannot de-identify it. Like there's all these scientific papers starting, I don't know, whatever, 2011, 12, 13, they keep coming, coming, coming that says like you're screwed, you can't, you, you can't anonymize this stuff, you can't de-identify this stuff, and this is the, this is the asset that we're gonna need um, to be able to protect. And what do we do with that? Like how do we govern that kind of thing? Uh, it's really, really hard. Because I mean even, even the language of whatever, there's 50 people in this room, um, even the language of what do we call these structures that are governing these things, we like to use trusts because I think of it as an asset. Um, I think Matt thinks about it as, 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 as labor. And, um, and I think there's pros and cons to both, but that's so hard to educate people when we can't, like there's, there's not a common language. Yeah. Um, so, so I guess I'm gonna make, take, take a step back. So, so I, I, I think that the, the world is complicated, but, but there are things that are basically unalloyed goods. Um, so, you know, like Sachs discovered the polio vaccine and uh, chose not to patent it, chose not to take any, any benefit from it. Um, so this was, this was an analog good for humanity. I, I don't think, you know, the, the, the situation might be complicated. There's, there's like the Sachs Institute, it wasn't his money, someone, well, Roosevelt's widow actually uh, raised the money for it and, and gave it as a gift. Um, and, and, and I think we, we want to look for, for places that, that might not be technically the most, the easiest ones. Um, I think, I think browser data is, is something that, that really worries me specifically um, because while, while the genomics is, is more evidently like uh, very dangerous initially, um, the, the risk uh, reward ratio of, of the browser um, logs, so you know, it's, it's very easy to, to install an extension or to install a VPN or um, you know, there's, there's many ways that, that you can leak this information. Um, this information is extremely sensitive. Um, it's, it's almost also impossible to anonymize um, while, while remaining very private. So, I think that um, I would, I guess, encourage um, to to avoid these places where 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 very it's very easy to to give out a lot. Um, so I think that's that's one place where, where I think there's not there's not so much to size. Like I think starting starting these data marketplaces with this browser data, like you know, the the technical side of me sees sees why this gets done, but I think that we want to. We want to think about the potential harms of that quite carefully, and I think those those potential harms are, are very large. Um, and and I think in in terms of healthcare data, um, so so the places where where Bitcoin and Ethereum have have been successful um, are almost by necessity the places that the state um, has some resistance to, um, or or very active resistance, right? So Bitcoin is good if you want to avoid taxes. It's good if like someone ransomwares your machine. It's good if you want to buy things that the government doesn't want you to buy. Um, is there anything else that it's good for? Um, it's good if you want to speculate around securities laws. Um, so, so there's a lot of things in medicine um, that, are, that are quite tightly regulated. Um, and, and many of them are, are, are state-granted monopolies. Um, so there is very artificial monopolies that, that, that we give companies and they're not <coughs> universally respected. 
um, and 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 trade in these goods, for example, um, is, is is one place where, where you know like the data that that the consumers of these goods generate um, in 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 these let's call them in, in like global gray marketplaces um, might be a better place, um, a place where, where I can imagine the benefits being substantial. Where I can imagine the people that are engaging in these marketplaces are informed enough to 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 provide meaningful consent. Um, I take one stab at this one as well. Go ahead. So, um, so I'm going to argue the other case that health is really important, um, and the reason it's important. So, so diabetes, for example, people think it's this binary thing: you have it or you don't. Um, it's incredibly nuanced. Different people that are diabetic have very different journeys, and only if you have enough of a of a um, of a cohort can you recognize these different journeys, and then can you help people go through those journeys. And so, so I think in terms of like the ability to radically um, uh, uh, like increase the quality of life for people, it, it is, is in these chronic diseases. And these are data problems because there's no cure. You, you have to monitor them vigilant. And, um, and, and these are information problems. And so like that's, that's something that I'm personally very passionate about is these information problems and how do you uh, help people as they go through these stages. Can I? So, so diabetes is, is, is a fascinating example. Um, so speaking of gray markets, um, so you can buy these old diabetes pumps um, that you can hack uh, like some open source software onto them. Um, so this is completely illegal if someone like sold you one of these devices. Um, so there's this community of people that have written the software and like put up the instructions online, but they're, they're not allowed to do this for you uh, because they would go to jail if they did this for you. Like if, if I, even if I helped someone do it, I, I could go to jail for for like just for teaching them how to how how to carry this out, even for you know they bought this the MCA stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so so you're, you're you're like you know this is this is a so for example people that want to have have you know constant uh, glucose monitors and, and constant insulin pumps um, attached to their bodies, they 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 have to be technically extremely you know the, the barrier of technical sophistication is extremely high because like the law prevents anyone from from helping them or or people that want to help them would definitely prefer their payments to be. Uh, you know, or, or the distribution in the mail, like th this whole stuff. So, you know, there, like, I, I agree that healthcare is extremely important, but I think it's important to be very specific in, 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 in which communities. Um, so, you know, we could have every, everyone taking pictures with their phone of their food um, and not realizing that they're also leaking, like, their location data and the metadata of the pictures or their income level or, or, or you know, who they're with. Um, or we can have and, and, and make this consumer app where you share what you eat and you sell that data. Or we can have the, we can build infrastructure for helping the gray market in people that want to go out and, and, and build better insulin pumps and monitoring systems and maybe don't always respect all applicable laws in all applicable jurisdictions. Um, and, and I'm saying that, that we should put much more emphasis on the second and we should be much more careful about the first. Yeah, I think that um, it's very critical when you build these structures for these data, whatever they are, is, is that um, it's really specific. Like you say, we're gonna we're gonna work with just these types of data, um, because I think only if, if you get very very specific can you actually look at the. I mean, even if you're using all of this privacy preserving computation, differential privacy, any of that kind of stuff, um, just by asking a question from different angles, you can leak all kinds of information. And so I feel like the only chance we have of getting this right is to start extremely small, um, uh, with extremely focused types of data, and 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 learn how to protect that, learn how to, um, uh, you know, what is dignity? Um, how do you, uh, if there is like more of this Henrietta Lacks thing, like what is the model to compensate people for that kind of thing? How do we do that? Right? And most likely that will be different based on different parts of the world. I mean, people view health data um, as belonging and the control and the ownership really differs based on what country you are. Today, most academic research and commercial usages of healthcare data is on de-identified data. But most of the time, this means you either have some loose notion that your data is going to be reused, certainly don't have any knowledge about specific usages um, that your data is going to be used in this way. But on the flip side, that powers most of our, uh, our research and our innovation. And by pursuing data dignity, are we somehow hindering that research and innovation? Um, how many of you guys know that hospitals sell your data? Okay. Not in Germany. They in, in, okay. They don't do it in Germany? 
<laughs> Can't happen in Germany. Um, <laughs> and uh, I have a number of friends that are university researchers in Taiwan, and all the hospitals there are selling data like crazy. Um, it happens in the U.S. too. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, and and I've been in conversations where they say, no, 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 patients cannot sell their data. You cannot do that. Like it's. It's already. Yeah, but 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 beneath everybody's just just completely selling this stuff everywhere. Like it's. <laughs> So I mean I th I think that that um, transparency into what's happening, and and actually going after okay how should we do this, um, that to have that conversation is what needs to happen because we can't just like stick our heads in the sand, we can't just all be Zuckerbergs and expect everybody to put VR, and forget what's going on. Yeah. Okay, response? so so here I'm I'm just I'm com I'm a complete radical here. Um, so the the way that that, that pharmaceuticals and, and 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 medical research is is, is currently carried out um, in is 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 completely incentive misaligned. Yeah. Um, I we require strong legislative approaches to this. Is this is this goes beyond the technical solutions? It involves the, the incentive structures that, that are set up. Um, the yeah. I I mean I've. I've, I've had consulting clients that, that were pharmaceutical companies. I'm not doing that again. Um, like, yeah. Um. <laughs> and uh, good for you, cheers. I, I, I think you have to go there. Like, there's a war. And I believe, like myself as a soldier, you have to go to the war. Right? Like, it's not okay to just be on the sides and say, hey, we can't go there. Like, we have to go in and fix it. So I, I I, I admire what you're doing, but I think we need more people that just that know what you know and go there and try to fix it, and keep fighting. I mean, but but you can you, you don't need to like work you don't need to work for the pharmaceutical company to be involved in it, right? <laughs> um, so so I know a lot of like uh, you know molecular manufacturers in India that like they're very distinctly not a pharmaceutical company. Um, they maybe take a very lax view of IP relative to let's say Pfizer. Um, but you know, there's <laughs> there's many ways that, that you can participate in, in in creating change in this way. I think in, in, in particular the Ethereum and, and, and the radical exchange community, there, there are two communities. Um, both on you know, both there should be pressure on the legislative side uh, to, to better align the incentives, and there should be pressure like outside the law to to allow people to to access um, life saving drugs and to develop new new treatments. So I got one more question, and then I saw some questions in the audience. Uh, Niket, on your website, you have listed theory and methods for better collective cognition with a focus on medical and scientific knowledge production as an interest of yours. Mm -hmm. And uh, how will the medical and scientific, which is really interesting in and of itself, uh, how will the medical and scientific knowledge production process change with data dignity? Um, so... I mean, to the extent that we can bring a better alignment um, to the underlying incentive, so, so we can think about like the dignity of our healthcare um, more, more broadly than just the dignity of our, our, of, of our, of our data, right? Also, the dignity of, of the procedures that we go for, through, um, the dignity, also the dignity of the data that we understand about other people's experiences. Um, so, so, you know, there's, there's many, many people that work um, in emergency rooms and in, and in intensive care in the United States. Um, they have uh, do not resuscitate. Um, instructions. Um, this is an insanely higher rate than the general population. Um, so, so the people that, that know like what what resuscitation implies in a hospital, right? Um, so the hospital's incentives are, you know, you get paid by the procedure. I don't know. Has anyone here ever ever gone to the hairdresser and asked your hairdresser if you need a haircut? <laughs> but 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 no. But but so many like there's there's not this awareness when you do it to a surgeon, right? Um, so, so there, there's um, the there was this guy that was uh, very good at uh, very good. He was very good at selling um, hip surgeries. He was like the the most prolific hip surgeon in the United States. Um, he like I think he carried out like thirty thousand of them or something over his career. Um, so he was an incredibly like bad hip surgeon in terms of the outcomes of, of the patients that, that he received. Like he was very profitable for the hospital. Um, so you know, and, and until this kind of incentives. Um, are, are better aligned. So, so I think, you know, like reaching dignity, a part of it is, 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 is being honest about what the current system, the way that the current system behaves. Um, 
and and the other the other part is is trying to surface more of, of the data that, that we already have um, so it's incredible like to even to get the statistics on like you know for Medicare so for it was it was the government that was paying for, for these hip replacements um, and, and that's why we have the data about like the performance of the guys um, this but and of course like the American Medical Association fought this like tooth and nail um, so so doctors organized themselves to to fight this data being being risen um, so and and yeah any any time you try to measure medical professionals performance um, with with the data that's already in the database there's there's huge amounts of resistance um, and and very organized the resistance they're they're quite good um, I don't I don't if, if anyone afterwards feels like uh, some t spending some time in Google um, you can look up uh, how how doctors uh, learn to clean their hands um, so so the guy that that tried to inform the medical community of this he was they didn't treat him so kindly let's say um, the so I think this the, the collective recognition in, in medicine is, is, is very broken. It's, it's, it's full of taboos. It has a professional class um, that, that has like established itself as a, as a rent-seeking um, like organization. Um, it, it opposes you know nurses and, and, and not full medical doctors providing care, even when that care um, is effective. It's, um, they, so uh, a, big, a, big, a big part of, of bringing dignity is, is bringing clarity to this data that already exists. That's not the data of the individual patients, but it's the data of, of the performance of the service providers and along the dimensions that the patients care about. Um, so it's, it's, easy, it's easy at times of stress to, to say like, oh, do anything that you want to save him. And well, you know, like they get paid for thing that they try and... <laughs> We'll give you a chance to respond, or otherwise we can start taking questions. No, so. no, I think that's, yeah. <laughs> okay, any questions in the back? Uh, Do we have microphones? Thank you. Um, talking about um, data when you collected when you are hospitalized, right? Do they, am I free as a patient to access those data and sell them, say, to a data cop? that has maybe a donor database, et cetera, or because the hospital uh, system retrieved those data, they have the copyright on those data. Like, am I free to access them and sell them as my data? Yeah, let this me take is, this. Yeah. So, um, so I'm an American, but I live in Taiwan, and Taiwan has nationalized healthcare. Everybody has, you know, the government gives you an ID and you have everything, right? And uh, you can have Western medicine, you can have Eastern medicine, right? Uh, it's, it's amazing. And so um, when we were working on uh, some of the software um, to collect your records, so you have like this longitudinal view of all of your data, um, my team was like, why does anybody need this? You just go to the government, they have it all. Right? And so I said, okay, um, I don't believe it. Right? And so I gave um, uh, the woman on my team, I gave her my ID and said, signed a piece of paper and said, hey, go, go get my data. Right, from Taiwan, this is this central government that has all of the health data. I said, go get this. And she came back with a few CDs and some sheets of paper. And they don't have my data. What they have is billing information. Right? That's not raw data. They, they have um, um, my MRIs in some weird format that I can't read. And so I said, this is why you need it, because even if you have rights to access your data, you don't have it, it doesn't matter. Like, it doesn't matter if you have rights to something if you can't possess it, right? And so um, even in the countries that have universal healthcare coverage that um, are entirely digital, most of the systems have been set up for billing, not for people, right? And so that needs to be flipped, and that's really hard. Like, the reason we're doing Facebook is because Facebook's easy compared to health. <laughs> like, it's really hard. Like, how do you change that? I, I, I changed the question. So if I go voluntarily to a private clinic and get tests yep. that maybe are useful for a donor database, et cetera, can, then I, can, can I then sell them because I paid a private? Depends uh, on where you are. Depends on your country. Okay. Yeah, there's no universal answer. Like, okay. and, and, and if, if you're a citizen in a different country, your data is under their data protection laws. A lot of hospitals, they can't leave, the data can't leave the hospital. Even if you ask for it, they have to give it to you in a different format. It's really, it's a total mess. Oh, yeah, there's no good tools. Then in the middle to the right. Thank you. 
Thanks. It's just a general comment, really, to the panel. Um, I think there's, there's something called private value and there's something called public value, which I think in health is particularly, the, the difference between the two is particularly true in, in the health system. So, um, and I guess uh, data dignity for me is something like data awareness, so where my data are going, and I, I think a dignity would be having the choice to uh, donate my data, my DNA, if it is for public research, for example, if I need to eradicate cancer or, or whatever, but I want to be paid in case if, if Pfizer is, is making millions of dollars out of a patent. So it's, I think dignity is less of a money maker, so is, is having the choice of this. Um, on, or, and having the choice will mean being aware of where my data are going um, in this context. So what do you think about it? If, you, if, if, you, if you're clear in mind, where is the public value, like knowledge, or, or public research, and what is the private value of, of, of having a patent of millions of dollars. Even the intellectual property rights has this double issue. I mean, you protect um, intellectual property because you want to maintain the incentive of people to create, but this intellectual property needs to be published. So that's a value because it needs to increase public knowledge. And I think in health, this is particularly important. Thank you. Yeah, so I think a, a part of it is what data we capture. Um, so, so currently we, I mean, we, yeah, we basically capture billing information. Um, so, so when you try to do medical research in the hospital, the, the values that, that, that are recorded um, are, are, are basically like billing codes and like the amount of the drug that was delivered, but um, if you, and, and, and very basic biological statistics, but you, you, they're not really recording the data for research, they're recording the data for, for this bureaucratic purpose, um, which I think already like diminishes some, like already like makes some degree of dignity impossible, right? Because they, they literally see you as a bag of money. Maybe the, the state is giving them the money, maybe someone else is giving them the money, but, but if, if, all, if all the data that you're generating is in you as, as, as a bag of money, um, this is very limiting. I think the other thing is the, what I would say that the free successful medical interventions are, are public sanitation, vaccination, and antibiotics. Um, so, so none of them are, 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 are private goods, um, right? They, they all have massive externalities. There's, there's herd immunity for vaccination. Um, there's the resistance um, for, for both vaccination and antibiotics. Um, public sanitation is, is, is inherently a, a public good. Um, and being able, I think the, the, the fixes to these are, 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 are first most, um, legislative in, in terms of, of making that the data that gets captured has to respond to, to the needs of the community um, beyond the needs of the individual and, and, and that these notions of, of dignity have to, have to be extended um, into in beyond like sacks of money that move around and sometimes the government pays for them and sometimes the private sector pays for them. I want to just follow up a little more. So um, um, hopefully people already have looked at these property regimes and say they're not enough, we need something different. Um, I hope people also look at public and private and realize that that's also not enough, this binary thing. Like in reality, it's, it's very nuanced. It's very, very um, fragmented. Um, uh, what is public, what is private? I don't believe in these binary things anymore, especially with information. I mean, information, depending upon how it's collected, where it's used, what it wants to be used for, like all, all of these things. Um, our notions of privacy, I think, are, are just outdated. They, just like our notions of property rights are outdated, but we need to, to, to come up with a lot more, um, uh, like, a, like a, a spectrum of these things. And, and that's, that's really hard when people try to, you're right or you're left, you know, it's, it's, it tries to get polarized into the binary stuff because that's what technologists or politicians like. But in reality, it's not. It's really nuanced. Yeah. I think we got time for one more question. Uh, so um, the most profitable businesses in the world in terms of revenue per employee are not Google or Facebook. They're pharmaceutical companies. And, um, and what Amazon has been really good at 
is sucking the profit out of every sector it it gets into. Um, Amazon, of course, uh, uh, has announced its um, uh, its first attempt at doing healthcare, and of course, Alibaba is way ahead of Amazon on that. Um, so, I mean, the business case for that is obvious: uh, ten bucks a month from everyone in the world for a personalized prescription to live longer uh, based on the aggregation of, of all of your data um, so that every treatment is learning from every single other treatment of every patient in the world. That's um, a bigger business to go after a monopoly in than any business that currently exists. And obviously, the three of you are committed to a different uh, future, but could you talk through how the anti-monopolistic or counter-monopolistic uh, version of, of uh, a, a global health service uh, uh, looks like and how, how you would compete with that more uh, centralized uh, scenario. Or, Sean, is, uh, is, the, um, is the end game that Bitmark is acquired by your investor? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, it's such a good question. Um, the the centralization, decentralization, this kind of, you know, it gets, it, it, it goes in sort of a circle, you know, and um, we've, or maybe a pendulum is a better way of looking at it, but um, the the big tech has been singularly focused on, on um, how do you extract value from that data, and they do it in a fantastic way, and if you believe that, that, that medicine and genomics is, is becoming a data problem, then we have a big problem, right? And um, um, I would tend to think that, that the only tools that we actually have to, to, to resist the centralization that happens with this data is, um, is if we can come up with structures that allow for, um, um, for ownership to become um, very fractionalized at a, at a global scale. And so um, I try really hard to be optimistic. It gets harder and harder. Um, but I feel that, that, that we have a chance. And there's this window. And if we really actually um, come together and we, we figure out how to make these new organizational structures that have shared ownership, that that this is a force strong enough to resist the centralization. Um, and, and if we get enough people that can, that can have like an alternative AI where the data that's being you know, shoved into this Death Star is, you know, is, is owned by people, like you have this weapon and all you can do is change who owns the weapon. You can't change that the weapon exists. You can't uninvent weapons. And so, so my my hope is that we we figure out how to change the ownership of the weapon. Yeah. I, I real quick comment from me, yeah, and then yeah. all, all the, our panelists join in. Um, I, in short, I think technology breaks down barriers to participating in things. Like social media turned everybody into a publisher. Crypto is going to turn everybody into an investor. And I think things like federated learning or differential privacy, um, secure join and compute from Google are going to turn everyone into a scientist, or at least they'll break down the barriers to participating in science. A place where you can see this today was um, Apple's heart study that was just published in the New England Journal of Medicine. They created an app. You could download it to your, your watch and instantly start participating after you know informed consent, et cetera in a study um, done across the nation. I mean, it's amazing that you can download an app and start participating in research. And I think the ability to combine something like that, download an app, um, having you know, access to your health information now through interoperability standards, um, combining that with ways to privately learn from your information is gonna be an incredibly powerful force that's gonna democratize the ability to participate in research. And, and you layer that on with Rational ownership and things like what Bitmark is doing, um, and the future looks way more decentralized and, and democratic and fluid. I don't have all the answers, but I'm at least hopeful uh, that that our future won't be owned by the, the likes of Jeff Bezos. So, um, I think that's all the time we have. So please join me in thanking my esteemed panelists.